Well, good morning, church. Good morning. First of all, it's okay to clap. You can clap. You can clap. It's okay. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. That's right. We're so thankful for you, choir, for sharing that uh, wonderful moment of reflection there as you sang and centered our hearts once again on Jesus Christ. So thank you all for that. As we're here today, I uh, do want to just welcome everybody and say hello to those online. Welcome and thank you for being part of our service. Uh, we're going to do something a little different here today, if you haven't noticed in your bulletin. Is uh, had the fortunate uh, event this week happen in my life, and it just kind of said, okay, whatever we were planning, we're throwing it out and we're doing something else. You know how God does that sometimes in your life. And uh, so the sermon you were supposed to hear was actually one of John Wesley's, and we were going to kind of re-preach a little portion of it, especially it was about uh, this idea. It was about the circumcision of the heart. But in that sermon, he actually gives a, a really kind of rousing uh, portion of it. It's about the idea how we don't lose heart, how we continue to go on through struggles, how we continue to go on even in times of hardship. We continue on because God's power is made perfect in us, and we have much strength in that. And so, congratulations. It was the best sermon you never heard on this day. <laughs> Sorry, you missed out on it, and so be it. But I had the event this week where I was uh, getting to visit with Reverend Jim Meredith, and of course, Ricky, and I see Ricky in the back. Thanks for being here today. And uh, I was visiting with them, and... Um, of course, uh, when you visit with people, and, and of course, uh, Jim's health is, is you know, always declining. He's, he's, you always know, many of you ask about him, and uh, he's, he's still very lucid and very there, but uh, you can tell he's struggling with many things. And of course, whenever in those situations, you know, when you see someone you love so much and know that, you know, I know his heart and what he's given to the church over the many years of his service, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm just praying, God, how can I love this person? How can I show love in just an amazing way? And uh, we're sitting there, and somehow in the conversation, Jim mentions about how uh, he mentions something about preaching in note cards. And I go, oh, Jim, you actually, when you preached, did you preach, you know, using note cards? And he said, oh, I had this whole system. And he tells me about this whole system, about how he'd write each and every single thing out, and then he'd photocopy everything and make it pristine and perfect, and then he'd memorize it and put it on note cards and then come and preach it. And then he says, hey, Ricky, go get some of my things. So Ricky goes back in the back room. And I didn't bring the box, but first of all, there's this big heavy metal box with all these note cards and, and notes in it. And then they pull out a book like this, and they set it in my lap. And uh, it is a book of Jim's sermons that he meticulously kept in order, numbered, and also pristinely kept. You can see how pristine this is, and just kind of, you can see how it's bound and everything. And this, just so you know, are the sermons 1201 through 1400. So again, just in case I know some math people are kind of like, 1,201, right? So many sermons at this point, to 1,400. Now, I asked Jim, I said, is this the last book you had? And he said, oh, no, there, you know, there's probably one, I think maybe one more after this. But what was unique about this book that they happened to pull out, as I began to open it and just look at it, I noticed the sermons that were preached in this era were preached in this room in about 2004 era, 2003, 2004. And I knew in that moment, I was like, I know exactly how I want to show love to Jim here today and to show uh, just not only respect him, but to truly honor him. As you know, uh, as pastors, we spend a good portion of our week uh, planning the sermon, finding, you know, trying to search the scriptures and figure out what God has for us and what God would want us to preach and to, of course, look at our congregation and think about what you need to hear and what spurs you on to, to love Jesus more and to love others more. And so uh, I looked through this and I said, uh, can I? Can I Part of this? And they're like, oh yeah, take it, take it with you. Don't have some fun, look through it, have a good time. And then I got home, or I got back to the office, and of course I looked through and I was like, I know exactly, I'm gonna find a sermon, we're gonna preach it here today, right? And as I was looking through, I found one that was preached here in this place. It was on uh, November the 27th, I believe, in 2004, by Reverend Jim Meredith. It was his sermon number 1359, in case you wanted to know. And uh, it's called Faith's Heartbeat. And I looked at the message. Not only did I love the message, but I thought it would be very appropriate for us here today, and I think it would spur you on. And so I asked Ricky and Jim, I said, hey, would it be okay if I preach this, giving, of course, all, you know, and I wouldn't plagiarize it, but I would give all credit to Jim uh, here today and note, of course, in the bulletin as well. And they said, yes. So thank you, Ricky, and thank you, Jim, for the honor of preaching this message. Let us first pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth that were spoken many, many years ago, almost 18 years ago, Lord, we know that they're pleasing in your sight. The Lord, may all our thoughts and actions and hearts here today be also just as pleasing. And may, Lord, we once again find that you are the God who does not change, that the God of 18 years ago is still the God today. 
So, Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Long ago, one university president told another, treat your A and B students kindly. Some will become professors. But be just as kind to your C students. They're the ones who will build your multi-million dollar science laboratory. My scripture this morning begins with 1 John 3.11, a verse that makes me feel like I'm a C student being treated very kindly. John could have begun his writing, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. John could have written, how many times do I have to tell you this? John could have written, don't you get it yet? Instead, he's kind to us slow learners. This is the message you heard from the beginning, 1 John 3, 11 through 24, my scripture passage for this morning. Of course, in Jim, he read his scripture, so I'll read it here today, just like he would have in those days. This comes from 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 11. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and see, sees that his brother is in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but in actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth, and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence, whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God, where we receive from him anything we ask, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey this command live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit that he gives. John's oft-repeated theme in this message is love one another. John may think, I yet grasp the idea, as I see him use the word love seven times, I wonder, where am I on love's learning curve? So consider a quick outline of the stages before love. These words illustrate stage one. I am ignorant and inexperienced. When it comes to this love, John describes, it's the stage of one person who has never truly tried it. They've not only tried, never tried it, but they've never heard it. Last year's Ohio State quarterback, Craig Krenzel. <laughs> Everybody under 30 went, who? <laughs> majored in molecular genetics. When it comes to molecular genetics, most of us are in stage one. Never tried it, never heard of it. Teaching can move people from stage one to stage two. They then say, I've heard about it, but I've never tried it. They're aware, but inexperienced. To teach about faith sharing, for example, may produce stage two people who understand what they hear, but do not put it into practice. Moving from stage two to stage three is a hard learning step. Stage three is awkward stage in which we say, I understand it and I can do it if I work at it. We see people in this awkward stage playing music, playing a sport, on a date, <laughs> driving a car, are sharing Christ with others. A lapse in concentration will bring catastrophe. Many people try to lead stage three Christian lives, concentrating and working at it. And John's oft-repeated love message tries to move stage a one person, stage two persons, stage three persons, ultimately to stage four. 
And in stage four, we say this. I understand it, and it's a natural part of me. Hear me clearly at this point. The Holy Spirit is how God moves people from stage three believers to stage four. The two Bible characters that are named in these verses are Jesus and Cain. We see Jesus throughout the New Testament, but Cain's name may surprise us. What do we know about Cain? We know that he was Adam and Eve's son, and that he murdered his brother Abel because he envied Abel's pure and obedient relationship to the Lord. John mentions Cain, I believe, because we need to see that even an innocent believer may encounter hatred. In other words, some people give believers every opportunity to hate them back. In other words, some people give believers every excuse not to love them. In other words, do not expect people to be lovable before you can love them. Stage three love, it grits its teeth and says, I'm going to love them even if it kills me. Stage four love says, my love is not yours to earn. My love for you comes as the Spirit works through me. That's why Faith's Heartbeat is an appropriate title. Concerning the human heartbeat, I hope that no one here is in stage three saying, I really have to concentrate to keep it going. A beating human heart is a stage four phenomenon, naturally and internally a part of us. Picture yourself so filled with divine love, so filled with the Holy Spirit that your love is as spontaneous as a heartbeat. Don may be the president of God's earthly university, and we may be some of his C students, but his gentle words reveal God's divine patience, awaiting a breakthrough for each of us when we finally hit stage four, and we get this love thing together. May the Lord add his blessing. Once again, the word preached, and preached yet again 18 years later. Let us pray. Lord, as we're here today, we thank you so much for Reverend Jim Meredith and the words that he so faithfully preached from your scriptures to us. God, hear it again today. It's quite a truth. We give thanks. Once again, as we give thanks for so many other things, but we give thanks here today to the many men and women and our sort of forefathers and foremothers of the faith that came before us, even to bring us to this point. That, Lord, we could worship you and know who you are, know what you would have us do, to once again have your spirit live inside of us. So bless again these words that were spoken today, these words of your scripture proclaimed. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, <clears throat> it occurred to me when I saw this book, I could have end with just Jim's words here today. <laughs> it occurred to me we need one other thing to, that we need to do today. And of course, this message that talks about just love flowing out of us and just pouring out. Is, uh, as I mentioned to you, you know, Reverend Jim Meredith, he doesn't seem to be in the best health, as we all know, it's a declining disease of Parkinson's that he has. And I thought, this might be a golden opportunity to love on him a bit. And so what I would encourage you to do, as your pastor, and uh, encourage you to just act in love, as we just heard proclaimed in this message, I want you to write a letter to Reverend Meredith about the message you just heard. As I told you, your pastors spend inordinate amounts of time Rightly so, but in order to mount in time on our sermons, and to know that Reverend Meredith has a whole shelf, a whole bookshelf dedicated to all his sermons on the shelf, I think it would bless him greatly to hear what that sermon made a difference in your life. And once again, know that the words that he shared so many years ago still echo in the halls of this room here today. And almost any pastor I've ever known would be honored by that, would feel loved by that, would feel at this moment of cherishing. And I just thank God that he's still at a place where he could read those notes that you would write him. He would know what you were saying. And that he would, in his heart, be so grateful and have those thanks for him. I think you could really make a good moment of love in his life. Church, let's do this. If you need his address, uh, it's found in the directory. If you don't have a directory, you can call the church office. Just as a note upon that, call tomorrow. Because tomorrow, as you know, this is the week of Thanksgiving. Melinda will be in office tomorrow, but not Wednesday. And so please call tomorrow. Uh, if you can't get a hold of Melinda, please call me. You got my cell phone and things like that, uh, and I'll be sure to get you their address. Of course, I don't want to post it up 
you know, we post this online, so it's not exactly the best thing to post people's addresses online. But uh, if you do need it, please contact the office. Be sure to give to a church. Let's love. And let's do it not only in words, but written words and through action. We stand as you're able this morning for our closing hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus.